Well, um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another session of the last day of our fabulous For the Love of Writing Festival. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm speaking, the Burrung people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And as we're meeting online today, I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to Aboriginal elders from communities who may be joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk very much in this introduction. Normally I um, um, give a bit of a spiel, but our next two guests need little introduction. You have seen them both already throughout this festival, and they are big names in the world of children's books and more broadly um, in, in the book industry more broadly, and they are equally big personalities. And what is more, these two um, guests are actually good friends. So if you've ever been wondering what it's like, what it would be like to be a fly on the wall listening to two authors having a conversation, well, this is your chance. Mm -hmm. Hazel Edwards and Susan Gervais have been friends for over 20 years and they support and collaborate and guide and advise and um, just generally support each other through their writing journey. And I think I'm going to very much enjoy being a fly on the wall during this session. So over to you two ladies and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So, Hazel, are you starting? I was just going to ask you the same question, Susie. <laughs> I'm, start. Okay, I'm going to start first. Okay. Firstly, I'm going to start first for no reason, um, but I am. Firstly, Hazel and I, my daughter lives with me, and when she hears the Skype, she calls out, Hazel! That's mm. who I get called at all the time there's always a skype something important has happened somebody's doing a website a web webinar something's happening in the publishing industry she is my source of literary information your turn hazel well i think uh, we're going to be candid on this one aren't we susie yeah. um and, and hope nobody sues us later on um, a mutual friend over 20 years ago, and I, I'm just no good at dates and things, said to me, you really should meet Susie Gervais. And I thought, no, I don't want to meet any woman that I'm told I've got to meet. Mm. Uh, and she said, you're very similar. And I thought, really? And I managed to avoid her for several months and oh. had almost a year, I think, and that was a big mistake because when we did get together we are um, perhaps emotionally at different ends of the scale but in terms of um, many other things that we'll talk about today um, I am incredibly grateful for uh, this friendship but also as a colleague because it's very the, the, the our talk today is supposed to be about be about writing being a lonely business or not being a lonely business. And although a lot of writers live in their heads and they work in their studies and so on, Susie and I are probably not typical in that we're both quite sociable. We do get out except during times of pandemic. And we also research our books quite a lot. So as a result of that, we've done all sorts of things. We don't hibernate at home all the time but we're different temperamentally. And um, so we thought that we would, I think she's over the top and she thinks I'm too serious. But apart from that- um, Over the top. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. Anyway, we thought that we would um, share some of the genuine, way, you know, what we genuinely do do because it's important for aspiring writers and for middle range writers and for well-known writers to have someone who is a peer that they can trust and incredibly important. What we mean by a peer is um, Susie and I don't write together, but we help each other in that sense of collaboration. We have other, other collaborators, but we do help each other and we're quite, um, uh, constructive in our criticism. I think that's a diplomatic way of putting it. Yes. Well, we tell the truth. The yeah, truth is, them. look, when you get um, an author and you make a deal with them that not only are you going to be friends, but we're going to share the writing life, the reality is that you've got to have in honesty. If I email 
like I have so much doubt about my work all the time. I've written something and I think, oh my God, it's horrible, it's terrible. And I don't want to ask someone who'll just say, oh, it's great, because that's a lie. I know there's something wrong. So I email Hazel and if she's kind, she'll say, that's very good. Then I feel better. If she's more critical, she said, but this may not work or that and gives me some ideas. But really, I need Hazel for my emotional support during the writing of any work because I suffer from serious self-doubt. And you might think, well, you've been published and so on. Doesn't matter. You're, when you write, you still are going deep into your heart, you deep into your ideas and thoughts, and you don't know. You don't have perspective. You don't know if it's any good. And I need a cheer team and a supporter. That's Hazel. Well, I th oh, so go along with that. But I think the point about a peer is it's somebody who is your equal, but who may not be doing the same thing as you're doing, may not even be writing in the same area as you're writing. Mm -hmm. I'm prone to try lots of different formats and I've been blundering around in some new areas of scripting which are really challenging for me because I'm not good at formatting. And one of Susie's great strengths is the ability to write a really tight synopsis, mainly for someone else rather than herself. But, you know, and I really appreciate that. And she cuts through all the waffle and says it's about this, this, this and this. And I think, yeah, she's actually right. Um, so what it is, is you need someone whose opinion you respect, but who has equal but different skills to you. And it's honestly about time management. Now, Susie and I are both pretty busy. We live in different states in more than one sense of the word. Um, uh, she lives in Sydney and I live in Melbourne. But um, it's also that we have different sorts of obligations and so on. We are both blessed with the fact that we have adult children who are skilled in media, which has been very helpful and in other areas. And we do appreciate and share those skills, but it's not a competition. And that's the other thing. Um, one of the difficulties is an outsider tends to think, oh, why didn't that happen to me? And that's a version of jealousy. We don't feel that. We feel that a writer is actually competing against themselves to come up with the best possible version of whatever that story or literary challenge is and to make it work. They are not competing against you. And so in that sense, none of us are competitors. Okay, there may be prizes and there may be commissions and so on, but ultimately you are trying to do the very best. And so I've been in on the groundwork of um, Susie's Heroes of the Secret, um, oh, here we are, right, prop, prop, underground. The reason I paused is that I've been through a few other titles for that. Million titles. Yeah, great cover, great title. And um, that you, you try, uh, you want it to work as well as possible. And so I made some structural suggestions too, which Susie either totally ignored or applied, and that's her prerogative. And we both appreciate that. And she'll tell me, oh, you know, uh, when we first started doing Hijabi Girl, Susie was very wary of the, of the name. Yeah, I was of so name scared. The I title. said, you get killed with that name, Hijabi Girl. Well, we, we've had a lot of issues, but we decided to go with it because coping successfully with being different is a theme I've got more interested in as I've got older too. Um, and it has been, um, I mean, 41 rejections, I think is the, rection, is the record of post. But Susie had qualms on that and her qualms were valid. And I applied some of her advice in that. So the thing is that both of us are interested in I think, I didn't know they were called that, but social justice issues. Now I've read Susie's bio, that's what we're interested in. As you get older, you want to write something, not a piece of propaganda, that's not going anywhere, but you want to write a passionate piece of work, which will enable the reader 
to go into somebody else's life for the length of that book or that play or that performance and hopefully beyond and be a bit more tolerant. Now, Susie's much more passionate when she talks about it and she draws very heavily close to home. And that's one of our differences, I think. I tend not to directly put family members in, but Susie draws quite closely on that, which makes you very vulnerable. Do you want to say something about that, Susie? Yes. I have been lampooned and criticised terribly. And, like, it was really important to have Hazel so that I didn't cry and carry on. But, like, in my I Am Jack books, which were drawn from my son when he was bullied and I, my heart was broken, and I wrote it and I asked my son, I said, can I... Are you okay with this? He said, yeah, mum, because he's such a beautiful human being. He said, oh, other kids get into that situation, bullied and parents and different people don't know what's happening. So he gave me the seal of approval. Mm -hmm. Wow, did I get criticised for how dare I use my family within my story? And I just thought, wow, I do it as a sign of respect for my kids and all kids. One, I recognise my son's journey he overcame it with a lot of support from family school friends blah and secondly I gave him the opportunity of being a hero he said I want to share that wisdom the other kids don't get it but when you get that criticism a lot of people and reviewers and things don't know we're human beings and they do their whatever criticism literary criticism and it just hurts it's really nice to have a friend who you say, well, you know, this has happened. And they'll say, oh, it's, I don't care if it's cliches. I need them. When you yeah. feel And I think it also and... depends um, on the uh, timing and on the age of your family as well. Now, I'm not saying I haven't used my family in stories. I've certainly used their situations or their playing hockey or whatever. And Susie and I are both grandparents. And now we have another generation of children whose interests we draw on. But when any teenager will be embarrassed by anything um, a parent or a grandparent who's a writer in their family does, and you have to be very tactful about that. But in later life, what I find interesting is um, my, my son just contacted me recently about um, maybe helping with an all-girls team in the Northern Territory um, because of the hijabi girl book and maybe I'd be able to help them and um, what you you find is that they get used to having eccentric writers in their family and that they do appreciate it uh, later on um, and I would have freely acknowledged that Trevelyan was the four-year four-year-old that uh, inspired the hippo but when he was about 10, he wasn't too keen on that. But later, when um, he had his own family, it made a colossal difference. But I would always ask, as Susie does, the permission of the family members to talk about any situation. At the moment, I've got a two-year-old. We're going to do a fantastic story on a gecko. I haven't asked the two-year-old's permission, but I've asked his mother and father. <laughs> the other thing is, I just secretly between us I've been and everybody in, else who's listening yeah, and recording i've been in huge trouble because i, I use closely uh, i've learned i use closely people i know and so on and i've had i'm very proud of this i'm not two books pulped due to defamation that was bad news <laughs> and I went into Coventry meaning no publisher would touch me for at least four years because they know came out and pulping five ten thousand books cost them a lot of money and even though I told them I'm very honest wow did my career take a dive I thought I'd never be a writer again I was very sad 
I think that's part of the broader issue of criticism too, and why it's important that we support each other. There's always criticism when you're a writer. Once you go public on anything, yeah. people will interpret it completely different ways from the way you intend it. Um, mm -hmm. And in, uh, this is where we help each other and support each other and say, well, is this criticism founded? No, it's not. Um, but you can't always go public and defend um, your peer necessarily, but you can look at the process. So, for example, in recent years, um, uh, the F2M about transitioning gender um, was the book on which I got quite a bit of flack in recent years because they said, you're not trans you're not entitled to write about that. You're a, a white heterosexual grandmother. How can you write about a trans character? Well, in my case, if I'm writing about an area I don't know about, a culture I don't know about, and I see gender as a culture also, um, I would co-write and defer to my co-writer on that content. Susie would do her research as she's done with her Burns books and other things. Um, in the case of the um, F2M book, which is now becoming a comic graphic novel with the two trans guys, one of whom I worked with before, and we were ahead of the issues yeah. of, of um, treating people for as people, not as labels. And um, this is where um, writers quite often will say, what if, and they'll look at a, 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 a situation and they'll write around that and then it happens. So the fiction becoming fact is quite common for us. So the, the timing, but we'll still get criticized. So for example, in um, uh, Celebrant Sleuth, which is my adult, mystery my central character is, is a, a celebrant who solves mysteries at weddings and funerals but the interesting thing is she is asexual and she's based on someone who made a request of me saying how come nobody ever writes about a character like me and I said what do you mean and I asked her and I got her to give me background and I got her to read the manuscript and this is another thing Susie is meticulous about is of having the expert and general reader read her manuscripts, and I am too, to make sure we don't have clangers. And in the case of the hijabi girl, even getting the length of the dress right and the folds on the hijabi right and the, and the um, food details right, Erzge picked up the fact that with our... Um, our puppets with larrikin puppets who are um, rice paper rolls and other characters that in a Turkish family they don't have kebabs as such that we had these shop based things so we fixed that so it's all those sorts of details really do need to be right so handling criticism and supporting another writer impartially is one of the things and that takes courage just sticking your neck out um, to uh, justify um, a, a point of view. Now, Susie's more political than I am and gets far more involved in issues than I do, but I will act if there is something that I think needs. And it might be that I put them in a story and I kill them off. Not always. I'm Susie, not over to you. <laughs> but, but can I say one of the things is when you are a writer at whatever level, um, no one wants to hear you talk for hours about writing. I've got to say that because writing is so part of my DNA and Hazel's, we can talk endlessly about what everyone else thinks is boring. <laughs> and just having that commonality, I mean, mm. no one wants to know what we talk about. Mm. I mean, unless you're a writer. And so also it enables us to test things. So if I see an opportunity that I think may be suitable for Hazel, I'll pass it on, vice versa. Mm. And sometimes we're in the same, whatever the category is, whatever the opportunity is, but it's really about um, uh, sharing that writing information because we're both in the industry and different nuggets come to you at different times. Publishing, you just got to know what's going on. Like you send your book out, 
to 10 publishers and they never get back or hurt, reject you and you're crushed. But, you know, we know the industry from Hazel brings hers in, I bring mine in, and I might say, well, they're all up in Bologna or they're all doing this or there's been a change of publisher in that house and they're not. And that inside knowledge is really important to your emotional health because you write and you put your heart and soul, your intellect and so on in it, you send it off, you wait, you get rejected, it's very crushing. People say you should be mature. I don't care. It still hurts. And having inside knowledge, you know, why should you send, you shouldn't be sending that all, you know. So we get that sharing of um, actually industry knowledge, which is really, really important. I think, I, think I, I would agree with Susie on that. And particularly I have known from the inside of a number of um film and TV options that Susie's been through that have taken an enormous amount of work, and I've done some too, that haven't always reached fruition, um, but they weren't wasted experiences because- I don't know, mine learned... wasted. <laughs> we've learned oh, from the- Oh my gosh, so long to come up with um, nothing. Which brings me back to the time factor that um, sometimes some subjects are timely or some projects are timely. And if you've been around long enough, hopefully it comes around. But I was going to mention the Wed Then Dead on the GAN because um, this is a sequel to Celebrant Sleuth. Now, this is the one that I deliberately put the ingredients of the known GAN, my Celebrant Sleuth and um, the... Um, Agatha Christie role playing together. And Susie said, the cover's a winner, but blah, 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 blah. And she was dead right on all of these things. And um, blah, she said, blah, you've got to format it properly. And I had to learn how to do this formatting thing, which I find quite challenging. But it is the fact that we can share the knockbacks but learn from the experience. And I think that that is a, a very important uh, factor. Now, um, Susie, what, shall also, we share with them the fact of how we wrote the handout that you've all been given that will have been sent to you? Um, and you notice it's in dot points, it's not in prose. Now, the reason for that is that we wrote it between us on our No, own. no, sorry, Hazel did. 85%, 90%, and my job was going, mm, yeah, good, good, good. Sorry, I have to tell you how that collaboration went. <laughs> well, I was worried because she, she had so many other things on. Yeah. And I tend to, uh, what I've learned now is to write stuff on my iPad on that little pad thing, whatever it's called, that moves from one of your devices to the other. But it's also got this nifty thing where you can send it directly to Susie from the top so she can uh, get a copy. And so it's just little techniques that we've learned um, in terms of time because when you're self-employed, and this comes back to the loneliness thing, you have to do all the grotty jobs as well as well, we don't have secretaries. We don't have assistants in most cases. It's just us. And since Susie and I are probably not the best digital writers around, would you say that was digital? Well, I'm, I'm hopeless, but what I do We're know... Improving. Well, <laughs> well it's, it's a survival thing. So this is what happens. Hazel rings me in the middle of whenever and I said yes and she's saying I'm just testing can you see me and I said yes, ah, I can yes. yeah actually I'd written that down to to make that comment as we've all moved on to zoom I don't know whether everybody else has realized but if you have a backdrop it's reversed when you see it yourself on your own screen but it's the right way round when it reaches the recipient. And Susie and I had both had the experience of being back to front or having, so for example, Susie's backdrop there, I am Jack and being Jack and, and so on. Yeah. She later tested with me and said, is it round the right way? It's back to front on my, my car. Now it's having someone with whom you can just quickly, that took us two minutes, right? Yeah, but, but the thing is we're always, we're always checking stuff. 
and also like um we because we're friends we can do digital stuff together not that we're i mean not that i'm very good but i'm good enough and what happens is say a friend of ours has said can we go on her digital spot we say yes and she needs two authors so we're friends so we go on together so we can sort of piggyback on stuff that's all and so just, oh sorry projects I have a bad habit of cutting across Susie. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize the difference between um, networking and using people up um, and generosity. Now, one of the things that attracted me to Susie was she's genuinely generous. In fact, to a fault, she finds it very hard to say no to anybody or anything, but she's working on it. Um, Not well. No. Well, within our sort of creative world, um, we do a lot of things for each other, but there are some who are just starting out who will are only doing things for what they can get back. And we don't work on that premise. We work on the premise of helping others, of maybe mentoring young people, which is why both of us are the patrons. And I always think maybe it should be matrons as a society women. I don't want to be a matron. Thanks. I don't want to be a matron. I look more like a patron. patron. I reckon we need a better word for that, Caroline. Um, but that's why we are both involved. And because I have a teaching background um, and Susie has a business background where she's used to running a larger <laughs> enterprise, but I'm, uh, I like the teaching side. I'm happy um, to now be mentoring some people who, uh, as, as a business arrangement, who are writing their memoirs, and I enjoy that. And I help them and I take them on. And that's where the concept of the hazelnuts has come from. The hazelnuts are the ones that are on the back of my, oh, wrong book, back of the book that have actually finished their works and so on. Now, Susie doesn't have Susie nuts, but she has the equivalents of many people she's helped in many areas, not for what she could get out of it. And that is the difference, the altruism. And it's been said that a number of children's authors are altruistic, naive fools. They are childlike. Well, childlike means enjoyment of enthusiasm and new things, that's fine. If they call us childish, that's a different matter. But I no, think- I'm childlike? No, I want to be childlike. I don't want to be childish. But there's <laughs> an assumption that if you write for children, you have an IQ commensurate with the age of your readership, which is mm -hmm. not so. And it comes back to the generosity of spirit that you need, that, like a child has, to write well in the area of children's literature. And that's the compassion that Susie's got in her passionate writing. Whereas I'm more inclined to the quirky, the odd and helpful. Yeah, but I do want to make the difference between networking, which some people put into practice as using up for commercial gain only, and others do for the sake of helping other people. And Susie does it to help other people. She could say well, more a bit more often. But you know what? Um, basically, having um, colleagues that you can talk to about your work when you're stuck and all the rest, it's very invaluable. Many people have got critique groups and a lot of the relationships, like Hazel and myself, will have come out of those critique groups because when you start, I mean, I remember starting off with uh, four or five writers, workshopping our work every week and sharing it. Um, all of them have become published, but we are still friends and if I need some assistance in reading a manuscript or giving or being stuck in fact I just went up the other day to Alexa Moses and saying oh look I've got this new idea I'm working on um and I don't know and blah blah and she just read it and she said this is what you need to do ABC so I redid it and sent it to her the thing is I do that with Hazel Hazel does it with me and really for all of you in writing, I can't suggest enough the importance of getting a critique group where you can one, share the industry, but you start with the practical work. The fact that, you know, you work out 
there's so many pages you're going to send and you critique each other's work once every two weeks, once every, whatever you like, but eventually you get a relationship going that will extend to the personal and then it will extend to your writing career and profession. And unlike uh, other professions, if you're a lawyer, you will go with other lawyers. It's, it's similar. You need to be in a group in order to develop your writing skills. And some people who are very new, are very unusual, they say, I can't share my work because of copyright, someone will steal my idea. You want to know something? There's no new idea in the world, but there is new voice. Mm. And your voice is what is unique. For example, with Heroes of the Secret Underground, if I can tell you there's a billion books on the Holocaust, but no, no one has my voice. No one. And my emotional agenda so the point of the matter is that that type of thing that i can't send off someone will steal someone might steal it who knows but you're not going to protect that you need other people to look at your work to talk about it in a friendly way to have coffee discuss the industry also whinge whinge is really important and you can't whinge outside friends because it'll get back and you'll be in trouble mm. and a small industry I, I, I would agree with all of that. And that's why some of the professional organisations that we've already mentioned, the Society of Children's Writers and Illustrators, the ASA, and of course, the Society of Women's Writers, the chances are you will find like-minded people within that group. But what I'd also like to suggest is that they consider the time. I think, quite honestly, it takes about a year to work through a major book whatever, regardless of the length. Um, and then pre-pandemic, um, I had a, a, a workshop called Complete the Book in a Year that ran for four years at the Public Records Office in Melbourne, was closed by the pandemic and we went online. Now, some of that is a loss because those participants have lost the ability to exchange face-to-face -face and hear the other, you know, 15 people's versions and, in a way, take them on as stepchildren and be interested in the process and learn from it themselves. There have been different ways of doing it online um, and that continues. It's not quite as good, but that was the reason I wrote these notes. Now, what's happening is they're starting to help each other, but they're doing it online now. And I think that's the significance of this particular festival at the moment. It has begun to give people the skills. We've all been pushed in to learning new skills of Zoom or Jitsi or whatever you're using. Um, and so you can find a like-minded um, supporter of your work who may not geographically live in the state or even the same country, perhaps. Um, but you can have that access to each other over a longer period of time and you can help each other. And I think that's a really important consideration. We're not limited by geography, just by the NBN or whoever you deal with. You know, the thing is, um, a lot of people say writing is a lonely business and it is in a sense of, you know, you put on your beret and you go to your attic and you write and overlook the park. I haven't got an That's, attic. Doesn't matter. The dungeon. I haven't got a beret. Well, you haven't got a beret. I'm sorry. That is really poor. I have a beret. I'll give you one if I ever see you again. No, don't, don't bother. Don't bother. Don't bother. But right. look, the situation is that um, if you don't get outside, um, if you don't get outside input, you won't develop you just won't i and agree totally lot, yeah and a lot of people and i don't disagree with this they get manuscript critiques which is fine that's not the same as having a pal a buddy in writing and a few buddies because you pay the money you get the critique well that's that no it's a long-term developmental project so it's actually worthwhile if you belong to Squibby or ASA, whoever your society women writers, really, really worthwhile getting that a relationship going so that you can improve your own work, share it, stuff like that. Because honestly, 
I remember when I started writing by myself and everything, still write by myself, but I thought when I finished a piece, it was a masterpiece. Wrong. But what it was is the beginning of something. Then you get other people comment who care about your work and develop until it does become that masterpiece or at least a piece you want. Can I, um, and perhaps Susie can talk about this too, she and I have both done a lot of travelling, both geographically. Um, she's been to Turkey and to Jordan. I've been in Antarctic expedition and Nepal and so on. Not because we're particularly physically adventurous. That's not what I would call Susie, but never mind. She is mentally. Um, uh, and at, one of the benefits of being a writer is that you go into other people's worlds. And so you find other people there for whom writing is a novelty and they're very happy, but they know about the content of what you're wanting to write about. And they are your potential expert readers. And it's also the bonus that as personalities, I mean, if you're a lawyer, you do the same sort of work for decades. If you're a writer, you are moving into different cultures and to different skills all the time because each book or each project or each script you do, you're meeting people with different skills and different orientation. I know that my experience in Antarctica was enormous for me, not just getting stuck in the ice with 34 blokes and having a chopper crash on top of this, not that, but rather the insight into science the beauty of Antarctica, but to meet a completely different group of problem solvers. Now, when Susie went to Jordan against incredible odds and physically not being terribly well and riding on donkeys and things, all of that broadens and intensifies your eventual riding. And that is the wonderful bonus um, we are vicariously taking our readers into experiences that they might not have otherwise. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I've got something shocking to say. I rode a donkey and I discovered why, oh my God, donkeys have huge, I'm not going to say it publicly, but they got huge somethings. And I was on this donkey, it was very disconcerting. But the I point think we'll censor this bit, Susie. Why? I'm just telling you, you don't know. Maybe it was a huge ear. Anyway, it was something. But one of the things is also when you have a pal, um, say you're speaking at a conference in Delhi, which is what I spoke at, um, what it is is you can share that experience with your friend and your colleague they can give comments, they will share that information on social media, as I will share. Hazel and photos. Take, you know, you just, but you can share the experiences because certainly on my social media, um, I don't sit around saying every minute I've got another book. I mean, how boring is that? Firstly, every minute I don't have another book. But I do share the life of being an author. And with that, all my friends and all the people who are integral to my life. So if you ever have a look at my social media, you'll see all sorts of different people who influence me and I influence them. And it's certainly not a lonely business. It is, I mean, you should have seen our Christmas party. We were limited to 30 people. Sorry, in Victoria, you're limited to nobody. But in our area, they all came in and we're all sharing and deals were made. Someone said, oh, look, I'm doing this, you know, YouTube. Do you want to be part of it? And someone's, you know, all that stuff. It's not a lonely business. Mm, no, I agree with you. And um, also, there's also the altruistic side of things. So Susie is um, a literary ambassador for a number of organisations and so am I. Yeah. But we pick and choose the ones we support. We cannot take on an endless one, but we are quite willing to be involved in it because we actually think that things like literacy are important. And so we do support those things. And as a result, you have a breadth of experiences and enjoyments, uh, like Susie with the Vision Society, with her uh, blue glass, uh, big blue glasses, etc. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's right. And, um, 
and we have uh, such a benefit of, I mean, we've my uh, and the other thing that our families become involved with those extended experiences. So my family's accompanied me to the Islamic Museum. My co-writer Erske took us to the multicultural um, museum in Melbourne, where where um, there was a display of hijabs in a fashion parade. And then she invited all our family to an iftar beside her mosque in Melbourne. And so we, we've all had a breadth of experience across cultures. So our families, although they may get irritated by the amount of time we spend in front of computers, are conscious that they do gain from it. Look, we added um, some hypotheticals, which we won't have time to do, because I think we're going to have oh, to I didn't add it. I didn't do hardly anything. Precisely. But that's all right. We've got three of the sorts of situations that we might be invited to quite often and the differences in our approach. And because we haven't got time, you can just read them from the handout, okay? Because I think that Blaze might be wanting to ask questions of us soon. Um, we have tried to cover, um, yeah. we've missed a whole lot of things. And that's what always happens. You, you prepare and it doesn't work, but whatever you haven't used now, crops up somewhere some other time and it's all to do with time management. Am I right, Susie? My time management is terrible. Yeah, yeah I can tell from the time on your emails. Yes, I do email at three in the morning. I yes. worry about her when she gets to 4.35 a.m. on emails. Carolyn, what would you like us to answer? <laughs> Right, well, let's have a look. So we can open up now to questions and answers. Um, so if oh, one just popped in straight away, I'll do this one first, then I have one too. Um, it's a very interesting conversation, thank you. Is there a mechanism to find a peer or is it a matter of luck? I have valued no. my peer group in my other professional life so much. There is a method and it depends on what you're doing. So for example, I'm head of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators and we set up critique um, groups, which is volunteer, and it's from picture books to young adults, and you put your name down and you eventually get linked with four or five peoples from New Zealand all around Australia. And um, some of them work, a lot of them work, some of them don't, and that's okay, you go to another one until you find it. And we've found from those peer groups, it's extraordinary. They've become best friends, mm -hmm. they've published, they celebrate. So that's through Squibby. Through um, the Society of Women Writers, uh, do you have something in Victoria? Have you got something? We have a number of different writing groups in Victoria that people can join um, and um, some are conducted by email, some will be meeting in person when we're allowed, but you um, write a piece and it goes off to your group and you receive, and then they meet up um, twice a year, usually everybody all together for a lunch or something. But peak friendships are formed through those groups in the same way that yours and Hazel's um, friendship is formed. So that goes on, it's a professional friendship um, initially where people are able to give good and, and constructive advice. And you don't have to have only one peer. Mm. It's possible. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Susie and I have a third person that we link with, uh, Jen McVitie, who runs Seven Steps every every fortnight. And it may be you have someone else or some other combination for different sorts of things. Mm -hmm. It's I wouldn't say it's like a marriage because you could have simultaneous well, relationships. You marry, but it fail uh, a lot. Yeah, well, <laughs> a collaboration, and, and I suppose in a sense, it's a bit like auditioning for a collaboration too. Susie and I have not collaborated over a, a book because we're looking at the long term. Mm. It's possible we could, but we have other things on. No, Whereas we have individual other collaborators. So collaboration um, is a bit like marriage too. Some end in divorce and some um, that are financially very successful can be emotionally crippling and vice versa. I know that, but can I say, um, so the key word is it's not luck, absolutely not. It's going to the area where there are people with writers and you'll see like they're mine. like mine. Mm -hmm. And some of them won't work, so what? Go to the next group until mm -hmm. you find your tribe. 
that could I suggest that age is not a factor too mm -hmm. um, it oh. could be cross-generational fairly easily where there are different sorts of skills it's like-minded people gender mm -hmm. doesn't come into it age doesn't come into it mm -hmm. accessibility does come into it mm -hmm. so depending on what your family and living circumstances are uh, they may interrupt it a bit but um mm -hmm. be very open-minded and um, and with the um, the two of you not having worked on a book specifically together mm -hmm. means that you both can retain that independent thinking yeah. about each other's work. So you always bring those independent eyes. Um, when one of the questions I was going to ask of both of you um, is, what's the best piece of advice um, that you've received from each other, or, or where where have one of you given where where have you been given something that's caused you to change direction? You want to say first, Hazel. I said to Susie, don't send that out yet. <laughs> um, and she told me, revamp that synopsis. And I think perhaps we were both right. I don't know. What do you reckon, Susie? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think um, our eyes make a big difference. I remember with your hippo books, which, you know, are classics and sold millions, just with your last one, just saying, hey, look at the first book, which mm. is a master, which is brilliant. Yeah, you did. And Hazel just took that advice on and like in no time at all she sent me a perfect book it's mm. just sometimes that outside information mm. helps mm. and for Hazel it's always don't send out it was my finger <laughs> you, yeah, the, the trigger finger um but and, and also though you can you can only take advice like that like um Hazel particularly with the um another hippo book in the series to be told have a look at the first one you've got to be told that by the right person as well haven't you because you've got yeah. to know to trust what they're telling you yeah I think it's also timing too Caroline I mean it's when you know there's something not quite right about it, and part of the reason you're asking them is you know because you've got that feeling quite yes. right about yes. it yeah um, but you don't know how to fix it mm. and I think that's where somebody else's structural comments can be, and, and Susie's advice on returning to the structure of the first book was absolutely spot on for the mm. rhythm. Um, mm. And I, I couldn't see that because I've been told to change. And mm. well, I've got to be diplomatic here. Yes, yeah. right. mm -hmm. okay. Um, <laughs> but, um, but definitely keeping it, I mean, and that's the same with um, anything, isn't it? You get so close yeah. to your work um, that yeah. you need sometimes to take a step back and let somebody else come between you and your work mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to provide that input. Now, let me have a look to see if we've got, have we got any, oh, yes, we have another question in here, I think. Um, no, I think I've answered. So do keep sending in your questions because I've got a few questions here that yeah. I'm going to ask. Um, um, so I'm going to keep going with mine. Um, can you give us a little bit of an insight, um, uh, both of you, into what you're working on now and what, what advice do you think you're going to be asking of, of your um, peer in that process? Susie? Do you want to, okay, I'm doing, I'm just, I'm hoping if I can get my not-for-profit work out of the way, um, on a series called Mikey McGee, well, Mikey McGee. It's the youngest chapter book series, and I'm really, really um, passionate about it. It's really about engagement in multicultural stuff and different things. But anyway, I sent it to Hazel, and she's just the fact that she reads it. Sometimes she says, oh, that's great, but there's something missing. I find that really helpful mm. because, honestly, when I've written it, I, I can't see it. I can't mm. see it. And just Hazel's advice is often very pointed. She just says, well, you know, that's not working. Do, do, do it again. Yeah, yeah. yeah, appreciate it. So that's, I'm doing this new chapter series, Mikey McGee, eventually, but I've got to do the promotions for my new book, which comes out in April. But hopefully after that, I'll start writing. You'll be working. That. And what about you, Hazel? Thank you, Suzanne. Well, and Hazel? I'm downsizing um, from hippos <laughs> to a gecko. And because I have a two-year-old grandson who'd had a gecko in the letterbox, um, I'm working with another writer and an illustrator on a very young one of series of three with a fun, really enjoyable um, little series. And um, that's been very pleasurable. 
The other thing that I'll probably do is to um, do uh, some more stories in the Solomon Sleuth mystery series, mm -hmm. and I'll do them a chapter at a time that equates to a future episode at a time because I'm really interested in the TV adaptation uh, with the right in here, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's completely different. And people often say, um, "Well, how can you write on more than one project at a time?" But quite frankly, I've always had one in different fields, or usually about mm. five. But now, what I find is that because I've got a big backlist, the sort of administrivia of keeping things going with rights and all sorts of stuff, I find the administrivia of being a writer when you have a big backlist is yes. challenging, but mm. there are opportunities in new fields that didn't exist before, and mm. that's what I'm hoping to remain open to. To um, use some of those new opportunities with titles yeah. on the back, yeah, to bring with, yeah into with, different. Yeah, well, I'd never even thought of a comic graphic novel before. Yes, yeah. What the mm. Boy Within is, and um, I think there will be more. Um, I think there'll be more emphasis on audio. Is my personal mm -hmm. uh, view, and I would like to um, do something with uh, not just a piece of cake being an author, which mm -hmm. is my. Uh, memoir mm -hmm. was close to being one um i'm not a terrific actor in terms of reading but there is something special when the reader is actually the original writer of the piece mm -hmm. so i'm not too sure about that but i would like to become involved with more audio yeah mm -hmm. and and Su suzanne any new approaches for you uh basically yes mm -hmm. you know when i first started and with my first book, my me, my publicist at HarperCollins would give me five pages of all my media list. You know, I'm going to go to ABC or do this or that. Great. And they have a publicist. Today, when I get my new book out, the question is not, here's your five pages. Mm -hmm. What can you do yeah, for yeah. us? And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, oh, my God. And what this means is that... We're really, really involved in doing endless quest answers for blogs. We're doing media mm. all over the mm. place. We're doing interviews. And the new interview process, which in the beginning was different, that asked you questions, you'd answer. Now, because there's so much social media, it's often up to us. Right. They, yeah. It is the interview question, but we're writing an essay and so what's happening is like it's a lot more pressure and also there's pressure to move into the video space media this, clips yeah, yeah. And nice. this is a godsend my phone because yeah. as it's become more i just upgraded as it becomes more suitable you can do your every single thing now ask for half a minute, one minute, two minutes, whatever they're asking for you to do it on your phone and sending it through. So it's become very, very onerous, the work. Mm. So I've got a new book out, as I said, in April. I've got a huge amount of requests and stuff, which is all about writing and spending a huge amount of time, like a journalist, doing whatever. But after it goes, I start. And also, you still got to keep life into your old books. Like, yes, yes. Yeah, I just got an email saying, Can you do because, say, my Jack is studied as a class set in many, many schools across Australia. Can you do this? Can you do that? And by the time you do this and that, you're not writing really anymore. And no. that's a struggle. Susie, what percentage do you think of your time now is original writing? And what percentage is that sort of what I call administrivia, maintaining your back titles and so on? I'd say 10%. Well, that's interesting because I was going to say 15 in no, creative stuff. Yeah. And um, again, the sort of example Susie was talking about, my first book, General Stories, now being put in with the untapped project from Melbourne University, yeah, yes. which is going into the libraries. And I'm thrilled about that. But it, and, and as an ebook and so on, but there's still work associated with getting rights back and do. So I think um, perhaps 
mine's 15 to 20 percent in fact Susie might be right at 10 percent because I haven't had the time to work the percentages out (laughs) well don't waste any more of your precious time to work them out (laughs) um I've got had another question that's come in here from Tracy and Spibby you spoke about networking versus using people and altruism could you speak more about this and in the early days of forming peer networks the best way to avoid this other than just gut feeling I, I think, oh, sorry, Susie, go, uh, Susie, go well, ahead. One of, the, one of the things is networking, has to, this is corny, but networking has to come from the heart, meaning how you behave normally. And what happens is it's all about sharing the experiences. Like I go to my friend's book launches. Yes, I stick mm. my big fat head in there, but so is all the other people. And put a little bit on my friends. So that becomes real networking. It's not even a thought of, it's like um, it's like having an authenticity. And also, so at the moment I'm working um, as one of the committee on with the Children's Book Council on an anthology. Now I've obviously, because I've networked in the sense of a huge, a lot of friends. So I emailed them and I said, can you put a piece in? We're not going to say, pay you with gratitude. Mm-hmm which is hopeless and two books which is really bad but they're my friends they're sending it in now my friends are very high profile authors people like Kate Forsyth or whoever it is big names and they're doing it but within that anthology CBCA I've got new young writers or new writers in the industry and as long as their work's good enough we ask them to submit and they will be included in an mm-hmm. anthology mm-hmm. with huge names that is beneficial to the new developing authors and how has that come about because they've been there at the book launches they've been there at the mm-hmm. swimmy events mm-hmm. i know them mm-hmm. and so one of the groups beautiful girls one more page podcast who are doing amazing things and when I saw them, they just joined us and I, and they're doing this. I said, oh, I'm happy to endorse that. And we put information on our website, this and that. Now they're bigger than Ben-Hur. Good. Mm-hmm. So it's networking based, I guess, on participation in the community and also identification of people with talent and passion and giving them mm-hmm. opportunities. That will not happen unless you're part of the community. Yeah, you you have to show up to be part of it, don't you? You've got to have your authentic self there, and you've got to engage in the right way, which is absolutely true. And I think um, um, this week in this festival, I'm just checking the time. Um, I think we've had a lot of authentic engagement um, from people um, this week. I think this. Um, could you imagine what the um, end of the day drinks would have been like if we'd all been together this week? It would have been absolutely <laughs> fabulous. And it's a shame that we haven't been able to replicate some of those networking opportunities um, virtually. But um, but it, but I still think that the number of comments that have been coming through. I spend a lot of the time fielding, um, re- replying, and, and fielding questions um, that have come in via um, email. And I think that um, that message um, has got out there during the week of this festival, that this is networking. You show up to events like this, you participate, you ask the questions, you compliment the presenters because they've done the same. They've showed up to share their skill and their expertise, just as um, Suzanne and Hazel, um, thank you for doing so today. I think it's always um, interesting to hear how other people approach their work um, and especially with people that we, we know and admire so much anyway. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been nice to be a little fly on the wall listening to you. And I like the banter uh, between the two of you. It's, uh, mm-hmm. I think you, you hold each other in check, don't you? Yes. That's yes. a diplomatic way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the other thing that we haven't worked out to do yet is the virtual clap. Um, so I'm going to oh, thank yeah. um, um, thank Hazel and Suzanne. So um, I'm sure everybody in the audience is doing the same now. It's just a shame we can't see anybody. But um, and before um, we finish this session, we have an important announcement because Hazel is now going to announce the winners of our love letter writing competition that we've been running. Oh, hold on. I've just had a, let me just see what this question was. Um, Kathy Brigden said a fabulous session. There we go. There's some good feedback. So now over to you, Hazel, for the announcement. Well, I'd like to congratulate um, these people who are the winners of the Love Letter Writing Competition. Um, And 
the uh, I, I think perhaps I should tell you the prizes before I tell you the winners. The prizes are the first one is a hundred and twenty dollar restaurant uh, voucher. The second one is a pack of five literary talks donated by Susanna Fullerton, and the third is a thirty dollar voucher for local bookstore. But that's not the real prize. The real prize is the acknowledgement of the worth of something that you've written. And that is what is so important for writers. So I'd like to especially congratulate these three winners. Um, the first is Emma Manning for her letter, uh, love letter. Uh, the second is Barbara Verity. And the third is Elizabeth McLennan. And obviously they have the emotional heart to write in a way that affects the letter recipient. So congratulations to all of them. And it fits in with the theme of this entire festival, which is for the love of writing. And it's for the love of writing in every sense of the word. Um, and I congratulate all of them. Wonderful, thank you very much, Hazel. We'll also be, um, we'll put the names up on the website in case anybody has missed those, but um, thank you very much. So well done, Emma. Um, I've already forgotten the, the, the people. Yes. Oh, I um, thought I'd, I'd we have the names an Emma though. in the panel, uh, Emma is in the audience. She's just had oh, a Oh, well shot. done, Emma. Because uh, she's one. Emma. It's Emma Manning was first, Barbara Verity was second, and Elizabeth McLennan was third. And they may well be in this hidden ether who have been listening to us. Well done. Good. Thank you very much. Well, that's the end of this.